Are 8 billion bytes of random access memory enough? It's a question that's been getting consistently asked for the past few years, and I think it's starting to come to a head now with Windows 10 losing support, and a lot of gamers updating to Windows 11. Condolences aside, what can you even expect from an 8GB machine in late 2025? Well, surprisingly, quite a bit if you're smart, but things do look bad on the surface. Before we dig into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. For this video, I tested three different memory kits in four configurations to achieve the capacities we'll be discussing. All of them were tested at 2400 megatransfers per second with a cast latency of 17 clocks. This isn't exceptional, as faster memory will perform better compared to slower kits, but for this video, we're strictly testing memory capacity as opposed to what newer and faster kits are capable of. Although the latencies are way higher than what the higher end, larger, and more modern kits used, capacity is what we're ultimately after. All the system specs are available in the description, and although we're using a less powerful i3-12100 with a still very relevant RTX 2080 provided by MJ, I think a less powerful CPU won't bottleneck as hard due to lower memory speeds. Additionally, we're testing on Windows 11, as that OS has a reputation for eating memory. With that out of the way, let's dive into the testing and see what capacity you should be aiming for at this point in time. For the first game we'll be testing, Battlefield 6, we're using the high graphics preset at 1080p with DLSS set to balanced. 8GB performed pretty well, considering the game requires 16GB of main system memory. Hitting between 100 and 130-ish FPS, the 8GB configuration performed much better than I was expecting. However, once we put in an extra 4GB, bringing our total capacity up to 12GB, the performance jumped up to a consistent over 150 FPS a lot of the time. But this configuration actually had some light stuttering issues that wasn't there when testing with 8GB. Updating to 16GB saw similar performance to the 12GB configuration, but all the stuttering was gone. 32 and 64 gigs performed identically to 16 gigs, so unless you're running other programs in the background, you can probably get an excellent experience with 16 gigabytes of memory, with smaller kits still working but having some performance issues at times. For Cyberbug 2077, and even though we're testing at 1080p at the lowest settings, with DLSS set to CNN mode at the balanced preset, we actually didn't see massive performance degradations at any capacity besides 12 gigabytes. Every other capacity was able to maintain an average near 90 FPS, with the 1% lows not deviating too much between each other. 12 gigabytes, though, I assume because we're testing with three DIMMs populated on a four DIMM board, is causing the performance degradation on average and in the 1% low. Even the maximum performance achieved saw drops when using 12 gigabytes. This leads me to want to recommend only using DIMMs in multiples of two on consumer boards, because although many boards have four DIMM slots for capacity, you start seeing weird performance drops when capacities are mismatched between channels. This is true when using an 8GB and 16GB DIMM in the same system, and most of the time your computer won't even boot with a configuration like that. For strictly being in-game, 8GB seems like it's enough, but I also think it's worth mentioning that the out-of-game experience was atrocious. The main menu constantly was freezing, and the load screen froze the entire system. I didn't experience any of these massive freezes out of game with 16GB or more of RAM, so for the best general computing experience, I'd say 16GB is where I'd put my interest in if cost is a primary concern. And 32 gigs if you're wanting an uncompromising experience where you're running Discord or OBS in the background. Fortnite actually performed similarly at all capacities on average, besides 12GB, but the 1% lows were significantly lower on the 8GB test. Even though we're also testing at 1080p at the low preset, with DLSS set to balanced, in-game I actually didn't really notice too many issues on any of the capacities tested. But like Cyberbug, the out-of-game menus were constantly freezing before getting in-game. Once you're actually on the main island and competing against other players, performance was fine, even though the statistics captured indicated lower performance at times with 8 and 12 gigabytes of memory. Once again, I'd probably want to use 16 gigs of memory at least, just to prevent the freezing in the menus, but in-game there weren't many issues that I'd attribute to anything other than a CPU bottleneck. Helldivers 2 I was interested in testing because I found it likes to use all the available memory, 
actually performed the best with 8GB on average, but the 1% lows and maximums come in pretty similar between all the capacities tested, once again excluding 12GB. The menus were fine for the most part, but I suspect the game streams in level data during the descent cutscene. Once I entered this cutscene on any capacity below 16 gigs, the game would hard lock up for 10 or more seconds, and then start running again like nothing ever happened. Once you're in game the experience isn't too bad at any capacity, but the massive lurch upon initial load does kill momentum for a few seconds. Fortunately the game is relatively smart with what it stores on the CPU side of things, but I'd still want at least 16 gigs of main memory to eliminate the freezes that seem to be consistent across most games. Minecraft Java Edition was chosen because of its memory-hungry reputation thanks to the Java Virtual Machine. We allocated three quarters of the available system memory to the JVM, and even though we're testing on version 1.21.10 at the fabulous settings with threaded rendering on a 16 chunk render and 8 chunk simulation distance, the game performed incredibly well, with 16 gigs or more providing a noticeable improvement on average. 8 gigabytes came in with an average and 1% low of 337 and 62 FPS respectively, with 12 gigabytes coming in very similarly, achieving 335 and 74 FPS. But once the memory capacity reached 16 gigs, the average performance jumped up to 361, with the 1% low coming in at 135. This 1% low seems to be an outlier, but the performance was hanging between 330 and almost 400 FPS a vast majority of the time, with 32 and 64 gigs also performing similarly, only with the 1% lows slightly depressed. I'd probably recommend 16 gigs to once again be your minimum for a Minecraft focused build, but this game can also fit quite comfortably into smaller memory footprints when it has to. Keep in mind this game was also originally available on both the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. The last game we'll be testing actually has a warning that pops up if you launch it with less than 16 gigabytes of main system memory. Oblivion Remastered. Thankfully it seems a lot of the memory leaks that happen during regular program execution have been cleaned up, and as a result we can achieve playable results on 8 and 12 gigabytes, but the 1% lows definitely suffered. 16 gigs and above saw similar performance on average and with the 1% lows, so once again I think this game will run perfectly fine with 16 gigs or more of main system RAM. The speed of your RAM also seems to help this game a lot if you're hot swapping data from secondary storage consistently. While 8 and 12 gigs do technically work, as in the game can be played, it at times stammers very heavily, leaving me to want to recommend 16 gigs of memory even if it's slower. Okay, so what the heck even is RAM? Well, with modern sticks of memory, it's a technology called Dynamic Random Access Memory, or DRAM. There are two types of RAM that make up the different levels of your system's memory hierarchy. DRAM, like what's found in DDR DIMMs, is memory that requires refreshing and is typically made of capacitors. You'll have gigabytes of this in your system. And Static RAM, or SRAM, built using purely transistors. This will compose the caches and registers inside the various chips inside your system. Both these types of memory in modern computers are volatile, meaning that they lose data once power is lost. There are forms of non-volatile memory available, Optane being the one that comes to mind immediately, but you'll commonly use NAND flash or magnetic hard disks as your non-volatile secondary storage as opposed to memory. SRAM is typically used in modern chips to build caches and hardware buffers or registers. It is quick, but is more expensive per bit because it requires six transistors thus increasing complexity, the physical footprint of each cell, and ultimately the end cost. Even older systems used to use SRAM as main system memory because of how quickly you could access it. Usually this was limited to at most a few megabytes, however with modern capacity requirements, DRAM becomes the superior technology to produce at scale because it requires less square footage per bit. Your system will end up mixing and matching SRAM and DRAM, with SRAM making up the smaller instant access caches, and DRAM giving you the gigabytes of relatively quick access and high capacity for everyday usage. With DRAM, at a fundamental level, each one or zero in a byte is stored inside a capacitor paired with a transistor. This transistor is important and lets us actually read and write, but the capacitor is where the data charge is being stored. Capacitors are often compared to buckets in electrical circuits because all they do is hold a charge in a dielectric material between two conductive plates. However, in this example, your bucket is leaking constantly, or has an incredibly high rate of evaporation, meaning you need to periodically refill it in order to maintain a specific water level. Branch Education has an incredible video about how DRAM works, and it goes super in-depth into both the requirements and physics of it. 
For the purposes of this video, just know that DRAM and SRAM function differently and are useful for different use cases. DRAM is what DDR DIMMs and GDDR make use of, with the different generations supporting differing bankrupt configurations, speeds and timings, and also capacities. As for what you'll need for a PC build in 2025 and going into 2026, I think 8GB of main system memory is truly starting to hit the limits of its usefulness on Windows 11. 12GB does improve some of these issues related to capacity, but just going for 16 gigs fixes literally every issue I've encountered. The enormous lag spikes when loading into games, to occasional stutters seen when swapping data in and out of RAM. 16GB are probably the sweet spot for DDR4 builds, in the sense that they were plentiful on the market and are really all you'll probably need for everyday computer usage, where gaming is the most intensive thing that you'll do on it. If you're looking for DDR5, I would probably just go for a 32 gig kit of memory, despite it being expensive, because DDR5 needs all the available bankrupts populated to achieve its peak performance. For everyday usage, 16 and 32 gigs are perfectly adequate, but for some light content creation, I would tend to prefer 32 gigs. 16 gigs still would work perfectly fine if you're working smartly, meaning you don't have tons of background apps open and actively in use. Even though I personally use 64 gigs, I mostly do that for programming and video editing. When I'm using DaVinci Resolve, I'm not gonna lie, I've never seen the program use more than 29 gigs of RAM, so I probably could get by just fine with 32 gigs. As for the ultimate operating system question, yes, Linux works perfectly fine with 8 gigs of RAM. Even the new bloatware distro, Mint, idles at like 2 or 3 gigs of memory usage with things like Discord and Chrome open in the background. Meanwhile, Windows 11 will idle on the desktop with nothing open at almost 7 gigs for a system with only 8 gigs of RAM. The easiest and most straightforward way to conserve memory usage is to turn off unneeded startup apps. Now, this also brings up the fact that Windows 11 is a lot more dynamic in what it's storing in memory. What I mean is that when I actually boot up a game, Windows seems to allow certain processes to free up memory. This means that the game will start will probably take a little while to load, but once you're in-game and playing, it's kinda normal. The game will use however much memory it's designed to use, and then once the application is closed, Windows will just balloon back up to like 7 gigs. It's almost like the OS is putting some threads or processes to sleep, writing them to the page file, and then waking them up when the application runtime ends. It's just a theory, but it would explain both the gluttonous behavior Windows displays towards RAM, and how you're still able to play games somewhat well on 8 gigs, albeit slightly depressed compared to larger memory capacities. You could probably get some lower OS memory usage with a special custom Arch Linux distro, but just be aware that Windows will use more memory at times, but it can also free up some of what it's doing when a game is launched. It'll cause a stutter or momentary freeze when initializing and or loading, but the meme-worthy blue screens when memory is full isn't really a thing on modern Windows. 16 gigabytes is more than enough to game on Windows 11, and I'd stick with that general minimum no matter what kind of build you're going for at this point in time. 32 gigs is another nice step up, but considering the current exorbitant memory prices, I'd probably stick to 16 gigs if you're already on a budget. 64 gigs is just unnecessarily overkill, because by the time your everyday computer will require that, the current memory speeds and technology will be archaically slow. If your system already has 8 gigs of memory, luckily RAM is designed to be upgraded or interchanged, and it's seriously one of the easiest parts of your system to swap out or add more to. This ultimately brings up the question though, is 8GB of VRAM enough? 